Let's take a look at the sync function again. Remember, it's given by x omega equals uh, this expression over here. And what I want to focus on is the zero crossings, the value when x omega equals zero. So x omega is going to be zero when this numerator is going to be zero. And that means that sine omega tau by two equals zero, which is going to happen when omega tau by two equals m pi for some values of m, for integer values of m. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, you can re we can rewrite this as omega equals uh, 2m pi, 2m pi by tau. So the important thing about this is that this particular equation is independent of t naught. So this depends purely on the pulse width tau and not on t naught. So uh, in other words, if I were to make t naught smaller, uh, this would actually have no impact on omega. Omega would continue to be uh, t naught, and similarly, if t naught were larger, it would have no impact on it at all. So, what does t naught larger mean? Let's take a look at over here. Remember, t naught is this interval from here to here. That's t naught over here. So that's sort of one period over here. Now, let's say I make uh, t naught larger. What that means is that this pulse and this pulse are going to move away from the central pulse. And as we make T naught larger and larger, it's so going to be further and further away. So we have more and more sparsity in the pulses. And in the limit, when T naught tends to infinity, we can think of this as being a single pulse rather than a, a infinite series of pulses. So in fact, if we've gone from a periodic eternal signal to just a single pulse, what is the impact of that on the Fourier series? Well, uh, we're going to see that this is what the series looks like. So remember, we are uh, still going to have the function x omega over here defining where the coefficients are. And the zero crossings, remember, are given over here. Zero crossings are given the 2m pi over tau. So this value is going to be sort of pi over tau 2 pi over tau, this is 4 pi over tau, and so on. So these values remain the same. But um, so what happens to the coefficients? OK, let's take a look at the value of the coefficients. The value of the coefficient ck is given by something which has t naught in the denominator. And so as t naught gets larger and larger, the, the ck values get smaller. But also, uh, more importantly, the uh, values of k themselves are going to get closer and closer. So the uh, omega not, omega is given by 2 pi over t naught. And so when we have, uh, when t got, when t go, not goes to infinity, omega goes to, uh, omega goes to zero. So it gets uh, uh, very small. And so, or rather I should say omega not tends to zero it gets very small. So this omega naught gets closer and closer to zero. And which means that this one over here, which is going for the value two omega naught is also going to get closer, but the zero crossings remain the same. And so what that means is that we're going to have our coefficients get closer and closer, filling in the space uh, between the origin and the first zero crossing. So as we get t naught becoming very, very large, Omega naught gets very small, and so the multiples of omega naught get smaller and smaller. And in the limit, what you're going to have is a sort of a complete filling in, and all the different coefficients will lie exactly on x omega. In fact, one can view x omega itself as being the uh, the envelope itself as being the Fourier uh, coefficients corresponding to that single pulse. So interiorly speaking, this gives us the general feeling that as we are going from an infinite series of pulses that are spaced apart t naught to a single pulse, what's going to happen is that we're going to go from a sequence of coefficients that are spaced apart by omega naught to being a sequence of coefficients that are infinitesimally close to each other and they're all lying on the envelope x omega. And in fact, what we can think of is that xt is going to be transformed into capital X omega, which is its corresponding transform in the frequency domain omega. OK, 
Okay, so so let me walk you, you through that again because it's a, it's it's pretty uh, complicated. Uh, well, it's not too complicated, but it's pretty interesting. We start out by noticing that the uh, value omega naught, which sorry, the zero crossings of uh, of omega are happening at these values two m pi by tau, and these zero crossings are independent of t. So they're completely independent of t. It doesn't matter whether t naught is smaller or larger. So let's make t naught larger. And that means the zero crossings here are preserved. So this zero crossing continues to be here. This zero crossing continues to be here. Okay. And what's going to happen is that the coefficients are going to be read off at the values of k omega naught, multiple values of k omega naught. But k omega naught is going to be smaller and smaller because t naught tends to infinity and omega naught is defined as 2 pi by t naught. So omega naught tends to 0, k omega naught also tends to 0, and the zero crossings remain the same. So these coefficients are going to be lying along essentially this value over here. And so arguing along these lines, what we were going to do essentially is to say that the function xt, which is not necessarily a periodic signal, can then be represented by an equivalent function in the transform domain. Of course, for a pulse, we get a sync function, but for a, a different kind of function, different aperiodic function, we're going to get a different function. But nevertheless, it will still be written in the form x omega, or to be more precise, we write it as x j omega because we know we are, it's a complex harmonic function. So the uh, uh, and Fourier transform then is written in the following sense. We say that x j omega, which is the Fourier transform of x t, is given by minus infinity to infinity x t e to the minus j omega t dt. So that is the transform of x t, and we also write it in this way. x t correspond, corresponds to the Fourier transform x j omega. And uh, that is how we uh, get this, uh, get the Fourier transform. Now, the Fourier transform is defined as the, uh, val as, the as a function, as a function of omega, which is going to be defined for even non-periodic and non-eternal functions. Non-periodic, non-eternal. And uh, the formal definition of this is uh, outside the scope of what you're going to study here. But uh, you should basically remember that we can compute the Fourier transform of a, a non-periodic, non-eternal function xt, of a signal xt, uh, using this uh, analysis over here. xj omega is given by this equation over here. Uh, note that uh, the transform is not a function of time. It's a function of frequency of omega, uh, or j omega, to be more precise. Um, and the uh, value of x j omega, particular value of omega, can be thought of as being the signal energy at the frequency omega. So the, the amplitude, the value taken by x j omega at a particular point in the frequency space corresponds to how much energy it has at that frequency. And the magnitude at omega equals, omega equals 0 is the DC component. Um, we can also go the other way around. That's why we're having a, a, the two-headed arrow. And we'll discuss the inverse Fourier transform, which goes from the frequency domain back into the time domain uh, later. But uh, before I end this segment, I just want to kind of step back a little bit and talk about what's going on over here. So what we're doing over here is that we're showing how we can go from a function of time, function of time, to a function of frequency which is x of t. I should be more careful. It's small x of t uh, to a function of frequency. We're going to transform that into a function of omega frequency, which is x, capital X of j omega. And so this is uh, a, a classic way of understanding how a temporal signal, how a signal in time behaves at, different, at, at its different frequency components and this is the basis of uh, really what you, everything that you study in, uh, in uh, signal processing, signal analysis, where we are going to look at bandwidth, or sorry, frequency constraint spec, uh, signals whose Fourier coefficients uh, are corresponding to the Fourier transform 
has values only for certain values of omega. So if you think of this as being the electromagnetic spectrum, which goes from very small values, such as uh, in the optical range, to the very large values in the uh, cosmic, ray, sorry, in the, in the radio range. This is all in the frequency spectrum. And what you can do is you can create certain signals whose Fourier transforms exist only in some range omega, some okay, omega or under a bar to omega over bar, that is say. And these frequency limited signals are able to be transmitted without interfering with other signals which are in different parts of the frequency spectrum. So understanding the behavior of XG omega is critical for us to be able to determine how to transmit signals of the electromagnetic spectrum without interfering with each other.